Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Oh my god, I'm so fucking excited. I, I can't I can't contain myself. I can't. I can't and I won't. Uh tonight, my guest tonight is an actor who was born in Los Angeles, California. He's been acting since he was a child. He's best known for playing Skull, one half of the bullying rival duo of the OG Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, a role that he has uh, reprised in spinoffs like Zeo and Turbo and Power Rangers in Space before eventually uh, leaving the franchise to continue on to college. I mean, he also appeared in the movie franchises, the uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie in 95, Turbo Power Rangers movie in 97. I think we last saw him, he made a, a cameo appearance in an episode of uh, Power Rangers Super, I Super Samurai. But this guy isn't just that, man. He's so much more. This man is a certified actor slash combatant with the British Academy of Stage and Screen Combat, a member of the Screen Actors Guild, and holds a PhD in theater studies from the University of California, Santa, Santa Barbara. He is currently an assistant professor of acting, directing, and musical theater at East Stroudsburg University in Pennsylvania. He is a passionate and talented actor and filmmaker who has a unique voice and a compelling vision. I am so honored to have him here on today to talk to us about his work, about his life, and everything in between. Everyone, give a freaking mighty morphin' welcome to our guest tonight, the incredible Jason Narvi, everybody. Thank you, thank you, please, please. How long is it? Uh, <laughs> hi guys, how you doing? It's an honor to be here. Man, I sound like a really decent individual when you put it that way. Like I sound like a guy that I'm like, he's okay. I won't press charges, you know? <laughs> Dude, you are you are absolutely awesome. Uh, I honestly, uh, I appreciate you for being here. I've, I literally grew up with you. I grew up with you. I was a kid watching Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. We all hated Bulk and Skull so much. Of course, oh. everybody hated us. We're the most hateable people <laughs> in the world. You know, listen, we met some of those guys. I mean, Steve Cardenas, yeesh. Oh, man. No, but, but, okay, I, here's what I love to, when people are like, hey, dude, I grew up watching you. I'm like, oh, that's not creepy. Because if I said the same thing, I've been watching you since you grew up. Like, like you'd be pressing charges. You would I mean, be pressing charges. It's, it's a little you know, weird. So, I mean, it was nice for you to say it like that, but it was, mm, come on. It was creepy. <laughs> it was a little creepy. A little Don't creeper. press charges. Don't press charges. Uh, so <laughs> No convictions. <laughs> Never I, convicted. Dude, you you are a legend, okay? You, you've you you've been around uh, in the industry forever. You, you are part of <laughs> one of the biggest franchises i mean you go to any country you go to any like any kid the kids today it, it was 30 years ago kids today no power rangers it's weird that they do like so so my kids are in, you know in elementary school and one of his buddies one of my son's buddies you know they're 10 years old that he rides the bus with and all stuff he he's a power ranger fan i'm like still really i don't even like it anymore like 30 years later and like you're still watching it really really so yeah, it's it's amazing. You, I, like of all shows, you look look at that show. You would not have thought that would have longevity. You know, know. you would Absolutely. not have. You would have thought it was. You know, it's you know, you know, take a couple of box. We're gonna take a couple of boxes like this, and we're gonna have them run like this. Kids will love it. And like <laughs> my butt. Thirty years later, there they are. Yeah, right. We're you gonna know. take. We're gonna take some old like japanese b-roll film yeah we'll dub a couple lines over we'll, we, we mm -hmm. hire a bunch of teenagers with attitudes and teenagers uh, with attitudes boy <laughs> is that 90s isn't that 90s it's so 90s <laughs> so 90s of all the stereotypes oh. they do on that show but you know okay so we when we first saw this show you know we had no idea what we were filming for the longest time i mean obviously <laughs> you know we read the scripts but I mean, you know how actors read scripts, you know, bullshit, 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 my line, bullshit, Perfect. bullshit, 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 my line. Okay. But yeah, okay. We knew there was giant monsters and all that crap, uh, but we never saw the footage of it. So about like three months in or something like that, they actually showed us the footage of the, of, of the, the Zords, you know, like they're like, here's the show. And we had books. We did have books, uh, the, in, in, in wardrobe. They had the books of the original series and it was all in Japanese, you know, and they would use that as a sort of style guide. Um, but we watched the footage of those Zords and we're like, oh, God, we're never going to work again. This is it. Our, our career <laughs> begins and ends here right now. Um, but after watching it for a little while, I'm like, you know, though, it it did remind us of Robotech. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that's it, not a coincidence because Tony Oliver, uh, who was uh, who was one of the voices on Robotech, um, was one of the original writers and producers, and we really looked up to him. But it also reminded us of like Voltron. And we're like, okay. So I could see how a kid might actually like it, you know? Uh, and so then when they actually threw the the kind of rock soundtrack and the Voltron-esque stuff, you know, and had all the good-looking guys like Polly and me, we're like, ah, 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 okay, we got to fight. We got a snowball's chance in hell. I mean, you know, they say, and I've talked to directors, I've talked to writers, heroes are only as strong and as as endearing as their villains, right? You know, so. yeah, you know what we used to say? I, <laughs> Paulie and I, uh, we were at a, at a con and I came up with the following slogan, heroes come and go, but idiots are forever. <laughs> that, I mean... Oh, so, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you know, like the Three Stooges, they're still around, you know? I mean, like, who was, who was the third Superman? Who knows? Who knows? Fair. I'd have to think you know. about that. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, so, okay, we're jumping ahead, right? Yeah, we got ahead. Sorry, it's, guys. It's, Sorry, got, everybody my, at no, home. My fault. My fault. Lord I got seas. way too excited. Sorry, we wasted, we wasted your time. We have <laughs> intentionally wasted your time. I, I got so excited to talk to you about, to bring back all these childhood memories. But first, <laughs> I do like, I want to settle us in a bit. I want, I want to get to know the man behind Skull, okay? I want to know, I want to the, the man behind the camera, the actors. <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm, hey, I'm trying to do a serious job here. I'm, really, so I'm, I'm trying to give you that. I'm trying to give the song that's in your heart. That's right. You that's know? right. Bringing it to life. Uh, no. So, so first and foremost, for the folks at home, what is your military connection? Uh, well, so my stepfather, uh, who I grew up with, uh, was a combat marine. He was in the last boot camp class that went to Nam. Uh, and he was he was uh, technically at the very end, so he served a lot of time in Cambodia, um, and he was you know, wounded uh, uh, during it pretty badly. Um, a lot of stories he still doesn't talk about. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that my mom later in life went back and became uh, uh, a counselor, a family counselor for the Navy, and it still is there today. Uh, so we grew up not terribly far from uh, 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 Port Wainimi, you know. Uh, in recent years, I got really lucky as an actor. Um, I worked with the USS Indianapolis Survivors Group. Um, we had done this is this is kind of a cool story. So um, there's a lot of people talking about it again now, but for the longest time, the the only way uh, are you familiar with the Indianapolis? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, of course you are. Everybody that knows knows, but the general public doesn't, you know. Uh, and so, for our viewers at home or wherever you are, it was it was the um, cruiser during World War II that actually brought the bomb overseas to Hiroshima. Um, that's another military connection. Everybody on my dad's side, they were Jewish, and they all signed up. They really wanted to kick Hitler's ass. I mean, all of them. All of them, and in a family of uh, God, how many how many sons were there? And there was like twelve kids in that family, and like all of them went off to war, and all of them somehow came back safe. Wow. But I digress. But that being said, so the the Indy uh, had brought the uh, the bomb, uh, little boy, or was it big boy, uh, overseas, um, and then uh, nobody on the ship actually knew what they were doing. They they just knew they had an important cargo. They dropped it off, and then they went off basically to training um, to drills in preparation for what they thought was going to be a land assault to, uh, of Japan. Obviously they didn't know they had delivered the secret weapon uh, on their way to the training grounds. They were sunk. Uh, I think it was about uh, just under 1200 went in, uh, were on the ship. 900 went in the water. 300 came out my numbers. I'm throwing them quickly. Um, and of course, as the story came out, a lot of people that were in the water had gotten attacked by sharks, um, the, the, as terrible as that sounds, the reality was far worse actually, because that was only a, a fraction of what happened. But because of that, um, the, 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 you know, the men were in the water for, you know, the better part, four or five days, depending how, you know, when they got actually picked up and when they got picked up out of the water there, there, it, it was horrible. They, they, they endured the absolute worst of the war. Um, and really one of the worst things that, that, that happened was, uh, because of the timing of the thing, when, uh, the bomb effect, you know, essentially ended the war. And there was this mass casualty event when America was supposed to have a happy ending, a happy ending. Um, and so the story both was 
buried and reviled, and the captain of the ship uh, 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 was court-martialed. Um, so for the vast majority of history, the only way that people knew it, I mean, if you ask anyone in the service, they knew about the Indy. Okay, they knew about the Indy. Um, some of them knew about uh, Charles Butler McVeigh the third, captain of the ship, um, but not a lot. Okay, um, and as you know, it was a cautionary tale there, but for the grace of God, go I. Not a lot of books had come out on it um, until Jaws. Um, when Jaws came out, uh, you know Quinn's monologue about you know they're they're getting drunk and they're showing off their scars and their tattoos, and he goes, "Hey, what's that?" He goes, "That's the Indianapolis Chief." Um, and he tells the story of the Indianapolis. And that was the first time most of the, the general public had heard about it. Again, the Navy, the U.S. Army, the press, everybody kind of wanted to forget that it happened. OK, there's nothing worse than, than, than a mass casualty event right when you think the war is over. Um, kind of like uh, was it the Sultana that, that, that sank with a bunch of uh, uh, Union uh, soldiers as the war had ended. They were all going back home and then it, it sank. But that being said, that was all that people knew for the longest time. Um, I happened to work with a couple of wonderful playwrights who had written a play about the Indianapolis. They were inspired by Jaws and the indie people were very happy that that had gotten, gotten the story out, but they looked at, at the play. This is, uh, my buddy, uh, um, uh, Jamie McGann and a Andy Peterson, and they were interested in Charles McVeigh, the captain, you know, uh, captain McVeigh committed suicide, uh, in the sixties. Um, and, no one quite knows why exactly, but what they don't know is that a lot of people, because of the way it was reported, um, blamed him for the loss of their their children, their their sons. And so for the majority of his life, he got hate letters that said, you killed my son. That's a hell of a burden to take on. So uh, a few years ago, we did it. A friend of mine, uh, Brian Fruits, uh, had directed it in Chicago. Well, Chicago's not terribly far from Indianapolis. And every year there's a survivor's reunion. And he asked if he could get their endorsement, uh, just like get the name of the ship out there and whatnot. And they said, no, we need to come see it. So Kim Roller, who's kind of the, the guardian angel these days of the, the indie survivors, came out to see the play um, and invited. She gave us the thumbs up. Uh, it was a very haunting play. It was terrible. It was it looked in the face what what. Captain McVeigh went through and what the soldiers went through. And it didn't glorify the war. In fact, that same year that that uh, that movie with Nicolas Cage, Men of Courage, had come out mm -hmm. and the indie survivors reviled it. It was too heroic. They're like, that's not what it was like. That's not what happened. Um, that's not what PTSD feels like, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so I was lucky again because my my stepfather had gone through it. I saw him go through it. Um, my mom deals with it on, on a regular basis with with her clients uh, at the Navy. She can only tell me so much. Obviously, um, it gave me the opportunity to kind of explore that, you know. And I played uh, Captain McVeigh, which meant the next year we went to the survivors' reunion. Um, I spoke as a keynote speaker to them, which is very um, wow. both. Uh, what a huge honor that I don't deserve me, who's just an actor, to speak to. Um, Navy brass and the survivors of the Indianapolis actual survivors were there at the thing. They saw the play. Um, and in fact, uh, some good, very good friends of mine, um, ended up, uh, who ended up being, uh, like the captain of the USS Indianapolis submarine, um, who actually got McVeigh exonerated like in the 1990s, um, actually came and saw it. Um, it was really, it was, very fulfilling. So there's, are you familiar with, with, um, this, this project called the theater of war? I, I think I've heard of it, but I'm not familiar with it. Okay. So, so there's a guy, uh, who, who, who started doing Greek tragedy, uh, for combat vets and their families. And his theory was this, um, the, the, all the Greek tragedies come from the fifth century BC, which was a century that saw, 80 years of war, 80 years in one century. And when he looked at the plays, they didn't, they celebrated the valor, but the people that were valorized were also broken people like Ajax, right? Ajax is known as the shield. He was the shield for the, for, for the army. And yet he went crazy. Right. And so theater of war kind of had this thought that maybe theater and performance was a kind of therapy. 
it helps you deal with things that you only see in your dreams and your nightmares in the past. It puts it on stage in a way that you can talk about it because it's bigger than you. It's not really about you. It's about the community, you know, and it deals with all, all the pain and the anguish that you go through. Um, and it celebrates you without diminishing what you've been through. And I think that's also why the, the USS Indianapolis survivors really appreciated the work that we had done. Right. You don't villainize, uh, uh, our, uh, our soldiers, they've been <laughs> victims of trauma. So, you know, when I looked at, uh, at Captain McVeigh, I kind of compared him to a uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, Joshua mm -hmm. Lawrence Chamberlain. You are familiar with that? Mm -hmm. The, 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 uh, the, what is it? 54, uh, Maine, the 54th Maine, I think now, uh, um, um, I'm confusing it with the, the troop from, from glory, but anyway, but they were in that position at, at Gettysburg. They were at the very end of, of the line, right? They were like down here and they were about to be uh, flanked. And so he held the line. Uh, so he became the, the hero of, of Gettysburg because if they would have gotten, they would have gone down the line, oh, the right. Confederates, it would have been a different battle, maybe a different war, but late in the war, he got a wound. I think it was at Petersburg and he didn't survive. He, he survived the wound. But it never healed. Yeah. And as it turned out, when he finally died in the 19 uh, teens, 19 odds, um, he actually died of that wound. Mm -hmm. So when Captain McVeigh took his own life, he really was still suffering that wound from Absolutely. the Indianapolis. And that's what killed him was was, was the sinking of the Indy. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Um, that's a long answer to a short question, but that's no. sort of why both uh, I have a deep appreciation for what 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 our uh, men and women in uniform do that's and good. how I've always I, I try instead of just doing fictional heroes like Power Rangers and stuff. We try to find ways to actually celebrate and tell the stories of our real heroes, but we're unworthy to do that. Nobody can do that. <laughs> but our heroes, no, you know, the, you know what I'm saying? Everything you said, it it hits home in such an amazing and true way. Uh, I'm a person who served, did heroic things, mm -hmm. whatever. I did my job. And, you know, you get, you see all these things all the time. You see Lone Survivor and Saving Private Ryan and, and uh, Black Hawk Down, which again, well, not Saving Private Ryan, but for the most part, they're true stories, uh, uh, heroic, valorous, amazing things. Uh, but you really talk to any of these guys. And yeah. they will tell you like what I did wasn't heroic. I, yeah, I was, exactly. I was doing my job. I was looking out for my guys. I was whatever it is. So that human element you talk about that is that is so true to this, you know, uh, maybe over glorification of heroism, whatever, or patriotism, whatever you want to call it. But like, and the other, the, the other part of it is that like 99% of the time, it's not like that. Like I was in an infantry yeah. unit we that was my job was to fuck around and find out that was my job yeah. and even then like 90 percent of the time it was just sitting around you know smoking and joking <laughs> like we used to say uh well that's that's the point right like like you know it, it's exceptional boredom 90 percent of the time and then the absolute worst sheer terror you'll ever have absolutely. and even look man even if that sheer terror is is your your di your drill instructor coming in and this is ripping you a new one like if you're a, if you're an 18 year old kid that's horrific yeah. that is horrific and and you know you, what we ask of of our our men and women in uniform is is immense you know um and i you, you i i worry if if Anytime we tell war stories, it is simply a recruiting tool for the army. I hope it's more uh, a celebration of what people really do. But, you know, real heroes don't talk about it. So Bill Toady, um, who was uh, he, he was the captain of the USS Indianapolis submarine, um, who ended up get, uh, at one of the reunions for the Indianapolis or th when they uh, christened the ship. He, uh, the, the survivors came and they said, look, you're, you're now the, the captain of the Indianapolis and the previous captain needs you, you know, uh, Bill Toady, you know, the heroism that he did, he would never talk about. It. And actually I won't, cause I don't, he was like on, uh, he worked at the Pentagon for years mm -hmm. and he was there for instance on nine 11. And he was a real hero that day and the people whose lives he saved and all that. But, 
he would never talk about it. He'd rather talk about saving, you know, about, about Captain McVeigh and helping him and, and his heroes would be the men on the original Indianapolis, right. you know, cause heroism, that's the whole thing. A hero doesn't see themselves as a hero. I always, I love to say, you know, you see the old movies, John Wayne is the hero. No, no, no. Jimmy Stewart. Like that's the real, like those are the guys, right? The guys you don't expect the guys that are in over their heads. How often when you were out there, you're like, what the hell am I doing? What am I doing? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> 99.9 percent of the time what did i sign up for um no this is great and i love it and it and it only honestly answered a couple of questions i had for you because something we talk about is you know what's your military connection you know things what are things that are you passionate about outside of your given profession and things and mm -hmm. i think we've seen a lot of that come out um <laughs> so let me ask you this then uh, getting to know you what do you geek out about right because and, and you know for some music movies tv video games like what's your what's your go-to geek out uh when you just when it's just you well i've got a few i mean history obviously i mean you can't really you can't really see it's too dark in here but you know i got i got my history like uh uh so a, a few things i don't geek out about the most of the geekdom stuff like that's lost its gloss for me <laughs> you know every once in a while i'll see somebody that i'm like hey that's so and so you know history i love you know the wild west i love um uh, God, what kind of stuff? I mean, obviously, I love music. I love music, but I don't geek out over it necessarily. I, just, I love it. Like everything I do, I gotta have it. Um, if if I go down to New Orleans where there's music every time, everywhere you 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 trip, there's music. It's mm. it's in the air. It's uh, you know, kids on a street corner uh, with all their marching band instruments. They'll they'll play funk, hip hop, jazz. That's the best thing you've ever heard. And they'll you know they'll, they'll pass the bucket around. Like that stuff makes me geek out. Um. Like, what do I do? What do I spend my time to relax? I love boxing. You know, that's the thing I geek out over a lot. Um, you can't see it on my wall. It's one of the things, like, I got a, a Muhammad Ali autograph. Uh, when okay. I was a kid, my real dad. Uh, so th 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 here's a good story. Um, and this is kind of how I got into acting, sure. actually, um, is I had gotten in trouble. I got myself kicked out of school. We won't go into what I did. <laughs> Um, there was three reasons you could get kicked out of school in junior high. I did all of them in one year. So, you know, um, and so that weekend, my dad, my real dad, uh, my parents were divorced, obviously, because I mentioned my stepdad, uh, was going to meet Muhammad Ali and get autographs. And I couldn't go because my mom and stepdad are like, oh, no, he grounded. No, 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 no. He is not going. Out. So my dad, now there's two different versions of the story. Um, Muhammad Ali was was older. He wasn't that old. I mean, I'm not that old. I mean, it was still the 80s, but he was starting to lose some functionality, you know, with, with Parkinson's and whatnot. But that he was not even signing uh, to so-and-so at that point just because it was a little bit difficult. But my dad said to him, look. My son just got himself in trouble. He got himself thrown out of school. Um, can you just, you know, write something inspirational to him? And so the champ just shook his head and wrote to Jason, try for greatness from the greatest Muhammad Ali, a whole damn sentence. Wow. And that, that to this day, I geek out over, you know? So, so when I go down the rabbit hole, yeah, I'll, I'll say, okay, boxing. And that's true. I, I do it myself occasionally i'm not good i don't claim to be good they'll kick my ass <laughs> next time i try to go sparring uh but but like i love like following people like that like like biography autobiography like real life history real life heroes that is the, the shit i geek out over you know but we can talk about more fun stuff if you want <laughs> i love i love black hats that Thank the you. guys, there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> that was for you. That was that, that was a little special for you. I, I like that. I like that. So uh, uh, the checks in the mail. Um, so uh, okay, last one. Just because again, I I, <clears throat> I love to get a sense of people. And so, random question: If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Why? And would it would it be used for good or evil? How big is it? <laughs> as big <laughs> as you want it to be. Oh God! What would my superpower be? Um, uh, uh I guess. I, oh God, that's a tough one. Uh, I guess to live forever. No, that sucks. That would get old, wouldn't it? it would that would get, get really old. That would get really old. My superpower would be to go back. No, uh, my superpower. Do I need one? I mean. <laughs> 
it could be very unassuming, you know, like uh, whenever you want a slice of pizza, there it is. <laughs> you know? Okay. So, okay. Lots of pizza. Okay. Um, that's a good one. Yeah. Anytime. Okay. Um, I don't need a subway pass. Mm. I, I'm the only guy. They're like, oh, hey, oh, hey. I'm like, I, I, I got a pass. There you go. Hey, uh, man. That's, that's terrible. These are not good. I, I clearly have no imagination. I've been looking at too many real people in the world. You know? You've been living in the real world way too long, man. Come on. Way too long. You come from a, a okay. sci-fi fantasy background. I mean, um, I, I, I joke. With I, I got it. I got it. Oh, I please. got it. I please. got it. I got it. I want the ability to go into any movie theater and during the opening credits, give the exact ending. And like, instead of me, like actually saying it out loud, it instantly jumps into everyone's head. And then was like, oh, oh, oh. Now that is an evil superpower. If I've ever yeah, heard yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly. So that's what you get. <laughs> Ruin that's what you get. everyone's time. Ruin all at once. everyone's time. You know, I love it. I love it. I told somebody, I said, uh, stupid superpower, instant clean. Like, like, I'm just, I don't oh. want to clean up anything and just boom, clean and just, and just, like, I would so not use it for anything other than oh, I'm just see, I would do yeah. I, I guess all my powers be for the opposite because I would love to go into clean spaces, and the moment I step in, it just whoosh, just a total shit show. <laughs> just Complete leave a mess disaster area. behind you. I love yeah, it. yeah, but like places that deserve it, you know, like like Urban Outfitters or nice. you know, like some place like that. Air, you know, Eric Crombie and Fitch, you know, just just, just yeah, just they tornado follows you. Just tornado exactly, <laughs> you know. Just, I love just, it. There you go. I love it. Um, okay, so so obviously, let's talk a little bit about about Power Rangers because again, Power 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 Rangers, Mighty Morphin, <laughs> the ring a bell? No, it's just uh, old. It's really old. Really old. Okay, uh, all right. Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, like I said, I like history. There you go. Let's, <laughs> let's talk some ancient history now. Uh, <laughs> how did you first get involved? Like, how did you find out about the role? How did you get the role? And and mm -hmm. what was your kind of initial impression of of the character of a skull? Uh, well, I mean, I got it. So I had auditioned originally at a cattle call, and uh, I was auditioning for Billy, which I was kind of insulted. I'm like, I'm a nerd. I'm not a nerd. I didn't get it. I'm like, oh man, I would have killed to be a nerd. Um, so then I got, I got Skull. Skull was great. So they, 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 they recast the character playing Skull only a couple days before they were going to start shooting the the original episode. Um, and so they they called me in. I did a lot of improv at that one. They called me in for the callback, and it was just me and Paulie, you know. Um, and we improvised the hell out of it. You know, we we hit it off. So that was that was great. That's how I got the role. Um, was really our improv skills and the chemistry, you know, because we we're a couple of idiots. Um, I love the character. Are you kidding me? Oh my god, he was he was he was the 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 shithead that I always wanted to be, but got thrown out of out of school for being. He was a caricature of my worst id, uh, mm -hmm. literally id, by which I mean id, vicious. So like I I model. He was a punk. I kept him as a punk er. You know, uh, he did. I look did look like Dicky Dale sometimes, uh, Ducky Dale sometimes, but. Um, but really the black hair and the spiky hair and all that, the greasy, that was all Sid Vicious. Although there's a lot more Johnny Rotten in there than you think. Um, and it's funny because when you, I look back on it, one of the great things is even at the age of, you know, even though I was playing a character, you lack, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Self-realization, mm -hmm. you know, he, you know, he was a harmless chipmunk. And I still, I thought I'm like, yeah, I'm beating the punker. I always wanted to be, yeah, I'm a total dick. No, I was a pussycat. And that that's kind of the funny part about it. That's the the meta theatrical part of it that was funny, right? The yeah. postmodern part of it. It's like, you don't know what an idiot you really are, Narv. Like, you think you're tough, but you're not. Yeah. You're just not. Yeah. I it, it I, I don't know why, but I'm envisioning. Did, did he ever have like a spiked collar? I want to say mm -hmm. that at some point there was a spiked oh, yeah. collar. Because it's such a vivid... Of all the things that I can't remember, there are days in my service I can't remember, but I can vividly remember yeah. Broken Skull in my mind, and it's it's crazy that that's my callers all the time. Are you kidding uh, me? That was all the time. At one point, I was dumb enough to get a um, uh, what do you call it? a choker chain, a choking chain, which is you know like it's 
which I didn't realize. I thought it looked cool with the spikes on the outside. I'm like, oh, no, I'm wearing it wrong. You're supposed to wear the spikes on the inside. Yeah. You know, which I'm like, holy shit, why would you do this to a poor animal? You know, I mean, I've met some pit bulls. I'm like, okay, well, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, some chihuahuas. They, they've got they've got thick skin. They can handle it. We're we're, we're sensitive. Um, so I, it, you know, you touched on it, and I gotta know because the chemistry between you and Paul was amazing. It was dynamic. I mean, uh, how did you guys develop that? I know you just said like it, it was kind of there for the moment, but but how did you capture that lightning and then keep it going for as long as you guys did? How do you capture lightning in a bottle, baby? How do you do it? Well, here's the thing. So Paulie and I both had had um, backgrounds in doing theater, right? So doing theater means we we were used to being, you know, working, at, uh, you know, long hours at one thing and playing with characters. And sometimes we were not always. Look at look at us. Look at that. Look at that nose. You see that? Can, you, can everyone at home see that? <laughs> see that? Uh, well, like that is not leading man material, okay? Uh, and I don't know if you've seen Polly, but I mean, not leading man material. So that being said, like we're not doing theater for you know 120 hours for one production, playing like the good looking guys. Mm. Hi, like I never played Romeo in my freaking life. You know, I was always you know the the shithead. I was Tybalt, or I was Mercutio, the goofy guy. And so those hours and hours and hours of playing the goofy guy and having that work ethic of how do we work the goofy guy and find something else more interesting and more fun and more interesting. Um, we shared that vernacular and that's pure luck, right? Mm -hmm. That's pure luck. Um, and one of the reasons that, that they replaced skull was because, you know, the, it, the, they had, had filmed a pilot um, uh, and they sold the show. The guy that played skull was, was a stunt man because, you know, Polly mm -hmm. and uh, bulk and skull were, bullies and so they were going to fight and they were going to be legitimate baddies um and paulie could do stunts for a big guy he had done stunts he was a stuntman for um louis anderson you know like he did stunts for for a commercial for louis and um so but what they realized is that paulie they're like well we should make the bullies a little less menacing um and so Let's make him a little more funny. Where Paul, Paulie knew how to be funny, and he, he knew how to act, right? And the other guy was a stunt guy, um, nice guy from what I understand, but he looked menacing, and he was bigger than Paulie. You know, like Paulie would be like, "Hey guys," and the other one guy would be like, "Hey guy, hey, yeah," you know, like like he was like way taller than Paulie. So, <clears throat> sorry, I have consumption. Um, so anyway, um. So that being said, so so Paulie, they made him the lead because he knew how to do these sorts of things. And so when they defaulted and they found me, it you know, worked. it worked. And, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to them. They, they, they knew Paulie well enough at that point. Actually, I don't know how long they had been rehearsing before they brought me on. Little, so they brought me on. My, my audition was on like a Wednesday. My callback was a Thursday. I was there Friday for costume fittings and it was me and Polly and the other six Rangers, you know, um, cool that's how quickly they were working. <laughs> you, you hear stories about like, Hey man, TV, they got to turn it over quick, but that's, yep. That's moving. That's, that's moving <laughs> lightning fast. <laughs> well, I think the reason they had to do it is because they were filmed. So the first scene that I shot it, so they had scheduled the scene and it was just skull and trainee. And uh, I don't know if it was because of the scene, but in the scene, I'm supposed to pin Tui to, to the juice bar. Like, yeah, wait here. It'll be a mm. POV. <laughs> hey baby, how you doing? You know, which like, see how you laugh. Yeah. You wouldn't know if it was Bobby, right? Yeah. Bobby. <laughs> That'd be you know? scary as hell. <laughs> so there, so I think that's why they're like, well, we got to replace this skull guy. We, we, we got, we got no more time because he's, he's working by himself. It's not Vulcan skull the first day. Yeah. So wow. that's, I mean, that's incredible when you hear that. And, and I'm curious, you know, obviously again, the two of you, uh, in that cast with all these people, um, what's maybe something, do you have like a, maybe a memorable prank that you guys did or, you know, something that, you know, you, you, you tried to pull on the other Rangers and the thing, or give us a good, uh, a good story here. It was called season three. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there were so many pranks. How do you pick just one? And you know, a bunch of eighteen-year-old, you know, shitheads on, on a set, 
Yeah, I got, I got some. I mean, uh, Frank was, you know, he he played plenty of practical jokes. Mm. Um, um, I do remember when when Cat was there, we had we had a, a whole slew of like a week of practical jokes, just nailing Cat because uh, she was the new guy on the set, right? Mm. Um, and like like for instance, like wait, was it Cat or was it Steve Cardenas? We did this too. You, you know, they look so much alike. <laughs> Very it's um, interesting. Where, where we took, uh, so like we took, like, I think it was Kat. Or was it Steve? Whoever it was, we took all the furniture out of their dressing rooms. They go in the dressing room. There's nothing there. They're like, the fuck? I think we left one hanger, you know, just one hanger sitting there. And then they're like, what the fuck? And they had to go to set. They go to set. They come back. And we took all the furniture from all the other dressing rooms and put it in that dressing room. So I couldn't get it in the den. Motherfucking Narvin. Schreier. Yes. Oh, it must have been a joy to work with. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. How <laughs> the uh, ADs uh, didn't see it that way. <laughs> on, uh, okay. So, you know, the, you know, kind of the, um, the other side of the coin that I'm always curious about is this is something that went from nothing, from not even little known, unheard, and unknown to one of the biggest things on the planet mm-hmm. very quickly. How do you cope with that level of like, sudden fame, sudden popularity. Uh, I would assume you can't go. Everybody knows what you look like. And, mm-hmm. and like, I, I'm sure this is easier in a day before social media and, you know, 24 hours of entertainment news cycles and all that. But still, I, I just remember seeing it everywhere, even in a time mm-hmm. before social media. How, how did you cope with all that? Well, I learned you could put whiskey in your Cheerios. <laughs> God, I hope that's not true. That's so no, oh, hell no, dude. <laughs> hell no. We worked far too much to have any good habits. Mm. I mean, good habits meaning taking care of yourself or good habits like, hey, woo Like none of that crap. Um, it, I mean, it was weird. It was, it was a cluster. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a real, it, it screws with your mind, right? Um, you know, when you can't go to McDonald's without getting mobbed, you know? We'd go to McDonald's. I'd, you know, have my, my little sister go get me a Big Mac. I'm staying in the car. You know, I couldn't go to Disneyland without getting, um, um, oops, sorry. I couldn't go to in a Disneyland without getting pinned down. But, uh, there was, there was a couple things that kind of keeps the ego in check. Uh, mm-hmm. for instance, um, at probably one of the trips at Disneyland where I was frequently getting mobbed. Uh, I went into, um, my, my, my family was in line. You know, I think I was there with my little sister, my parents, maybe even, I don't, I think, um, but I, I remember going into one of the stores at Disneyland and I went to buy, I went to buy something. Um, and there was somebody at the counter and they had just bought an autograph book and they turn around and they look at me and they go, Hey, can I get your autograph? I'm like, okay. Oh no. They said, can you sign this for me? That's what it was. Can you sign this for me? I went, Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. Who would you like me to make it out to? They said, uh, could you put two Jimmy from Donald Duck? No. <laughs> Excuse me? They're like, yeah, this guy here. I bought the autograph book for my kid who couldn't make it down here. They won't write Donald Duck for me. I can't find Donald Duck around here. Can you just do it for me, sir? I'd appreciate that. I'm like, sure. <laughs> go you fuck go. yourself donald duck <laughs> donald duck uh so that was that was you know the sort of a you know put your feet back on the ground you know nobody's wow. special you know but i mean it, it was weird um and and it was it was one of those things where we knew that it was a phenomenon but we were also in a lower demographic right mm. we were kids uh not the 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 adults uh, and so it was e- easy to keep our ego in check, but the pressure was there. I remember, um, so we, we hit it off. Uh, we became a, a hit the, the, the moment we premiered and we didn't come down for years. Um, and with numbers that nobody's ever seen, still hasn't ever seen. I think at some point we had like a 90, I'm not exaggerating when I'm like, we had like a 90, Shit, we may have had like a night, like upper 90s, like nine above 95 percentile of viewers in that demographic at that hour. Like, we're watching that's that's unheard of, mm-hmm. it's obscene. Um, and so, but you know, we, we went through this season, you know, as it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And when the season was over, we were all like back to 
being broke. Um, and then when we when, when when the next season when we came back, they, they needed. Over Christmas, they're like, "Well, you guys shot forty episodes, which is great, you know, if you're if your family ties, but you guys are on every day, so that's not enough. Mm-hmm. You got to get back in the studio. So here is Christmas, and we have to go back to start filming things. And I remember the first day back on the set, so we'd all become big. Um, we all knew we were not coming down. And when that Christmas came around, we became even bigger because of the merchandising, if you mm-hmm. recall. And so I remember going to the set and I'm going to the, the, the men's room and I'm walking to the bathroom and I won't name names. Um, Cause I don't really blame the person. I, mean, I was in the men's room um, and the door flies open and slams against the wall. And one of my fellow actors yells at the AD I'm going to the bathroom. I'll be back on set when I'm back on set. I'm like, and so, you know, we're standing at the urinal. So it's like that out there, is it? Yeah, man. It's like that now. Because like now, every like all the pressure was on. Yeah. It was on. Yeah. You know, so finally we felt, in the first season, we, we all felt that we were playing movie star. Now, someone got the impression that we were. And that was a different beast because now you have responsibilities. Now you think you can get more money than you can. Now you're hoping for the next big thing. Now you're wondering if you're getting screwed. Now the network wants more from you. Now they're asking more hours. Now they're, so it was just, it was a different ball game, you know, that I didn't expect my first year of acting, you know, and we knew it wasn't coming down anytime soon. And that was the, that was the kicker. You know, that was the kicker, not thinking we're going to be unemployed in, in, in six months. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, speaking of which, and this has always been something I've thought about because obviously a big part of the history of the Rangers is that there's a lot of turnover. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and, and a lot of that comes from the show that it's based on and, and how they did things. Um, was there a sense that you recall – Again, don't have to name names, but was there a sense of like our days are numbered or like how, when in the process? All our days are numbered. (laughs) When in the process did they realize like, wait a minute, we're going to get replaced very quickly because it. Oh, right, right, right. If, if, if you gave, uh, if you gave a dirty look to David Yost, you were gone. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I, I had to go through my like head which ranger I was gonna pin that on. I'm like, am I gonna do that to Amy Joe? Nah, I don't no. Amy Joe jokes. That's uh should I do it to I don't wanna okay. Yeah. David seems okay, like sorry. one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, nah, David's cool. David's cool. No, no, no. So David used to live up the street from Polly um in Hollywood. And it was, David was wonderful. David's actually a very shy guy. Yeah. Okay, he's a very shy person, and so we would go to his apartment. When we had when we weren't shooting, which was rare, but I'd go crash at Polly's because Polly was twenty one and he could buy booze. Uh, no, we go hang out at Polly's, and then we would get all boozed up and we go down to David's apartment. Like, hey, Dave, how you doing? Oh, you gotta get, you gotta be on the set at six o'clock. So what does that mean? You gotta go to bed like you should be in bed, David. Hey, no, no let me I gotta, let me say sorry. <laughs> No, but actually the way it would go is we'd go down there all shitty drunk and um, we'd hang out at his house. And after being there for a couple hours, he's like, we'd be like, so when's the next time you shoot? He goes, oh, I'm shooting tomorrow. <laughs> and we're like, why didn't you kick us out? He's like, I enjoy the company. Like I'm, I'm late for the set, but I'm just having a great I'm time. Late, I'm, I'm enjoying it. He's, he's a sweet <laughs> guy. Um, well, yeah. Of co- okay. So Paulie and I always thought we could get fired. I mean, that's why we worked our asses off because we weren't the heroes. We we figured we had a little bit of job security when they decided they were going to put Bulk and Skull because we were only in four episodes to begin with. So, uh, but then they went back and reshot most of season one um, and put Bulk and Skull in every show. We, you know, that was that was about because that was because B- B- Paulie and I. We didn't realize how sexy we were. You had the juice. <laughs> yeah, we had it. And the Rangers just didn't. They just didn't, I have to tell you. you um, no, but so so we always felt we were we were uh replaceable. But when when Walt, Tui, and Austin uh were replaced, that 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 kind of set sent a cold chill up our spine. But um, we were told by the management and th- this, they were, they're like, okay, look, original cast, 
won't go anywhere until you want to. Mm. So there was that. So our biggest concern always was being uh, canceled, you know, was, was getting canceled. And, you know, yeah, they may replace you at any given point, turn you into a chimpanzee. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so there was that. Well, yeah, so there was that, you know. Um, so the idea of, of turning over the cast every season was a later thing. Right. You know, this is American TV. And, and it's true that Saban kind of, they walked a fine line. They wanted the product to be big, not necessarily the characters. Mm -hmm. So. Not, not necessarily uh, the paychecks. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I said it's it. like I working said it, for, It's like working for the government. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, was there ever any, uh, I, I want to be sensitive about this. Do, do you ever? <laughs> no, wish you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> do you ever wish like you got a chance in the in the costume? Like, was there ever like I was like Ranger Envy? Like, did you ever want to morph her? Did you ever want to swing around a weapon? I mean, yes, I would frequently slip into Jason Frank's spandex. Is that what you're saying? Is I that mean, what you're saying? Just, I mean, of course, we always wanted to be heroes because what what uh. What what twenty year old doesn't want to be the hero? But at the same time, we knew we had the best gig. Those guys had to behave themselves. We yeah. didn't. The yeah. more we were asked, you know, complete jackholes, the better off we were. You know, uh, so we knew we had the best gig. You know, um, when when I say, for instance, that that Jason Frank had a sense of humor, people are like, really. Well, of course, that poor bastard wasn't allowed to show it, right? Mm -hmm. Neither was Austin, not, neither was Steve, neither was Johnny. And Johnny's got a great sense of humor, sure. right? They weren't allowed to show that aspect of themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, I, we, it was better better to be Bulk and Skull always. <laughs> well, I, I know Women doubt be Bulk and Skull. Yes, I know a lot of actors will always say it's way more fun to play the villain, right? The, always. The hero always. is so no, straight and fun. laced and... Yeah, they can only screw up. And if you're yeah. already a screw up, there's nowhere to go but up. You know. <laughs> the something about the original series and, and and probably for the first couple of years too that always amazes me when I look back at it is it wasn't just a show. Like like they put you guys out there. Like I remember mm -hmm. like the the touring of the malls and like when that was a thing. And like they 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 put these guys in, in show spectaculars and they're in the costumes. They, they did flipping. like they did like a touring like oh it was really kind of a stage production. Tony yeah. Oliver wrote it that toured all across the country for Power Rangers. And they they did make us do a bunch of appearances. I don't remember ever doing a mall appearance, but we probably did. We did appearances at Dare events and you know they really and and part of it was that they didn't know what to do with uh, uh you know a, a major act that was for kids mm -hmm. so they're like well we'll just throw them out there make them do whatever dance monkey dance <laughs> <laughs> you know that, that that by the way that's supposed to be my squeeze box but it sounded like a monkey i'll go with yeah, it sure. <laughs> there you go yeah, that was a donkey that was a donkey <laughs> they made us pull carts they made us pull carts it was horrible it was brutal you ever see pinocchio it's crazy. It's crazy. You know, I'm like, I can't fathom any other, per, uh, uh, the cast of Breaking Bad. Yeah. We're going to have you guys do live performances, uh, here at your local, hey, what, although, Dairy Queen. although what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Oh, what the, what the hell's his name? Oh my God. I feel Which terrible one? late here. Uh, but he was actually, he was one of the monsters, monsters du jour. Yes. yes uh, uh, Bri well, Brian mentioned. Cranston. Cranston, yes. that's yeah. it. That's where Billy gets his last name. Billy Cranston comes from that. Yeah, from Cranston. Yeah, that's true. But, uh, it's cr crazy, and I, I remember he he hid his identity because he didn't want to be associated. It's like he went under a pseudonym and whatnot. Um, oh my god, yeah. we're already at an hour, dude. I have so many. Let me ask you one more thing. Let's do a lightning round. Do a lightning round. Oh, super fast it. lightning round. Okay. Uh, you you do a lot of convention appearances. You you link up with other um with other cast members from the past. G give me what, what's the craziest fan experience interaction you've had at a convention? Uh, me, 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 me. No, no comment. I'm going to say no comment. There's too many of them Too no, co no comment. Okay. You're signing certain body parts. Uh... I mean, like, 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 uh, I got, I got better stories before the convention circuit when I was a young single guy, but we won't go into that. Gotcha. Okay. We'll talk in the break. We'll talk on the break. Talk in the break. Talk in the break. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm curious because a character like this obviously is so, uh, 
I don't want to say one dimensional, right? Originally, like he was very, he, yeah, he was yeah. who he is. Dimensional, yeah. How do you deal with the stereotypes and assumptions that people connect that character to who you are as a person? Well, clearly, I, clearly it bothered me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have run out and get a doctorate, right? <laughs> you know, no, no, call me Dr. Nervy. Doctor, I'm a doctor for like, crying out loud. I do Shakespeare. Overcompensating. Like, much, I'm yeah. compensating for some stuff, right? <laughs> like, I've got issues. I got okay. issues. Fair enough. Yeah, Fair I mean. enough. Um, speaking of your credentials, and I had so many questions that I wanted to ask you just about your 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 wonderful career in, in academia and, and whatnot. Uh, is there is there something um, that you 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 unique that you bring from your past experience into your your work as a scholar and in, in teaching? Yeah, I mean it's process. First, it's process, but it's also. Um, so, uh, you know, as, uh, I, I train actors. So you have a process, enjoy the process. The process creates a better product. The process, it's not about doing a performance. It's about having a good process. Let the performance take care of itself, take care of the people around you, learn what people are doing around you. You are, they're not there to support you. You're there to support them as an actor. Okay. You're working on a team, whether that team is a, is a film crew or a stage crew, you're working with them. Um, uh, also, uh, pop culture can be just as important as Shakespeare. And it is, uh, it, 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 it's one of the things that allows us to, to, uh, thumb our nose at at convention become who we are and if we don't see ourselves on on uh back in the books we need we we need to create new new films and books and tv shows that show people like us so that those are the big takeaways outstanding fucking we're, we're clipping that we're putting that on social media uh how do you last one how do you balance personal and professional life and and then you know what are some of the challenges and joys of being a husband being a father and a scholar and a a OG legacy guy. <laughs> like it's hard to balance all the above. I mean, obviously, being a family guy is something that is that is that then is the most rewarding. It sounds so douchey when you say it, but it's true. You know, I, I when I when I work my ass off and I don't see my kids for weeks at a time, there's nothing more that I want to do than just sit on the couch and do nothing and hang out with them. You know, so it, it's tough to balance, and I'm trying to find balance. And when I figure it out, I'll let you know. Um, so there's that. So when you go away to do it, you know, I did a project with Johnny. Oh, 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 oh! Can I plug the project? I, we're, that's the next thing is you're gonna get to plug whatever you want. Okay, so I'll finish the sentence. So yeah, so it, it's tough to do all the above, uh, and, and you have to you have to wear different hats, uh, and you have to be a different person for each each group. You know, uh, so there's a little bit of skull in every uh, every Shakespeare lecture I do, um, and there there's a little bit of uh, Shakespeare in every. Con uh, Comic Con I show up for, and my poor kids have to deal with Macbeth all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's tough to bring that baggage home. All the time. It was tough when I did McVeigh. Like to, to sure. bring that home every night was brutal, I'm which is sure. one of the reasons I got so into my boxing because I'm like, uh, the, the next role I did was was Macbeth, and I didn't want I didn't want to bring that home like I did McVeigh. You know, I can't imagine. Mm. Um, oh, the one last thing is it, what you know you you get uh, these actors who um you know are very famous lines and are quotable you know people shout at you in the street i'm curious like as skull what's like the weird thing that people yell at you or, the or they want you to say they want me to do the laugh oh. it's the laugh you know <laughs> the laugh you know i don't even know if i could do it anymore for crying out loud <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole different guy that did that laugh that's a that's a it's a different <laughs> world back when i was here i'll do the laugh yeah, hundreds of packs back then. Yeah. Um, all right. With that, which by the way, we have to have you back eventually because there's like so it. much more to dive into about your career. And again, I'm super fascinated about again the choice to to go the the educator route and the and the PhD. I can't. It, it, I, it's your brain... it's your job. I think if you <laughs> if, if you believe in your art at some point, I, I, I know I, I use the term lightly when I'm talking about skull, but if you believe in what you do at some point, it's your job to teach it to the next generation. It's your duty. For crying out loud. That's what you got to do. Absolutely. Oh God. Words to live by. Preach, man. Preach. Um, go ahead. You as take as much time as you need. Plug anything i want i want everyone to see what you're doing and and so social medias and then projects you want to uh oh yeah I'm, I'm on instagram and jason a narvi i think i'm on the other stuff but i don't check it so don't go there you'll find me on facebook too i've got a couple ones um uh <laughs> i don't have underwear on there uh okay so uh i, I just looked at it i saw it sitting there um so, okay, here's the, the next big thing. And I don't know the drop date, to be honest. Okay. So we just completed uh, Vox Rocket Studios, who I sometimes produce and, and act for. Uh, or actually, I should say I always produce for them, but I sometimes act. So Johnny just finished directing a film for us that uh, we just 
named Spades. Uh, we just dropped the trailer a couple weeks ago. We just got the first edit through. Uh, so I play Jim uh, James Bishop, uh, a cop uh, who's tracking down a vigilante. Uh, I don't think I should give away too much. Uh, there, there's some cool stuff I had to do. Uh, uh, Johnny tried to give me some military training on that one, but nice. uh, so uh, you go check it out. It's a good film. It's 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 a dark who done it action anti hero superhero film. Oh, I so like look it. for it. Spades, directed by Johnny Young Bush and oh. starring Jason I, Nardi. Oof, I'm excited. Well, when I when I cut all this together, man, I'll throw the trailer in there. We'll do some fancy editing and whatnot. But uh, that's exciting. Uh, definitely want people to go follow you on your social medias. And and dude, we got to have you back. D down I love the line, back. Um, we got to do a part two because well, I love what you do. I love what you do and who you do it for. So that's why when you when you told me, I'm like, dude, because I I don't like your all that stuff. I'm trying to balance. I don't have time to do a lot of these these days, sure. you know. Um, so I'm like, hell yeah, for this 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 is worthwhile. So uh, thank you for letting me, let me let me let me be here. Uh, thank you for letting me do this. This is awesome. Uh, and honestly, everybody's been like, you, you have people in the chats that are like, can we replace the co-host with this guy? <laughs> like, like you, who's the co-host? It's not uh, Mike, is it? He's a Marine. Bad he'll Mike. Kick my ass. I, oh, I, man, he'll <laughs> keep my, don't, don't say that people in the chat. Don't say that. <laughs> he's coming for you. He's coming. He's outside right now. He's outside your door. Uh, <laughs> uh, everybody, this has been the absolutely incredible Jason Narvey. I want to give you the last couple seconds here to say goodbye to to the audience say say your piece and then we'll we'll toss it to a break all right uh well hey uh i guess this isn't goodbye but farewell till we meet again hasta luego bonjour bonsoir i feel like i'm making love to the microphone now. all right love you all right but hey guys thank you for all you do seriously uh nothing but but matt but mad admiration. See, I'm even hitting my head. I'm so I'm so excited by what you did. But thank you guys for everything you guys do. So uh, it it, uh, it it it's an honor to to speak to to all you wonderful vets and servicemen and women right now. So thank you. Oh man, you're incredible, dude. I can't wait for part two. Uh, we'll, we'll bother you next year. We're not gonna. We're Sounds not, good. We're bring you back too good. But all right, guys, this has been Jason Harvey. We'll be back with more right after this. Peace. Peace.